Rolando Estacada. My name is Rolando, and for today's episode, we're going to be doing a follow-up to the Mastering the Buoy episode. This is going to be a little bit of a series on the buoy. The buoy is something that I just absolutely love, and as I mentioned in my first buoy video, this was basically my first love in terms of knives are concerned and continues to be. So what I'm going to be covering today are a couple of things. Number one, the difference between a combat buoy and a utilitarian buoy, because especially nowadays, they're a little separate, they're a little more specialized. But we're gonna be covering a very special technique today, which is the buoy reverso. The reverso goes straight into a back cut flow, and the reverso is, I would say, one of my top techniques of all time in any martial art, because it's so quick, so fast, and it gets you on the way out. You know, Tactically speaking, just in terms of the flow, in terms of the intelligence behind the technique and ease of use, it's really cool, so I can't wait to show that to you. So let's take a look once again. I've shared this uh, a couple of times. I've shared this a couple of times now, but this is the very definition, in my opinion, of a combat buoy. This is a Bagwell custom Damascus made by none other than the late, great Bill Bagwell. And something I want you to note, you have the horns over here, which is great for the guard, but also supposed to disarm. If that seems, if you happen to be in a buoy duel and you just need to catch it, but I think it's a great guard, that's number one. Also number two, a sharpened false edge. And you will see in the video, a big part of what makes it a combat buoy is the fact that it's balanced so well that it moves effortlessly. So I'm gonna give you an example right now. When I do a back cut from this position, it just naturally wants to move on its own. So if I'm here, you see that little bounce? See that little bounce? That stored kinetic energy is a big part of the balance that Bill Bagwell created. Because if I'm here and I'm dropping a back cut and then it just, you see that little bit of kinetic energy, a little bit of kinetic energy, there's that stored kinetic energy and the tendency that wants to move into the next technique. And that's what makes this particular buoy, my absolute favorite, the custom Bagwell Damascus that Bill made for me, I believe it was back in 2010, 11. This is um, absolutely my, my prized possession over here. So this is the very definition of a combat buoy. You're looking at a false edge, you're looking at a guard, right? So those are the main components that make it a combat buoy. Now let's take a look at my, one of my favorite buoys also. This is from Cold Steel. And Lynn Thompson, you know, the former owner of Cold Steel and Bill Bagwell, there was a time where they were talking a lot about buoys because Lynn Thompson was very dedicated to building out some of the more iconic production buoys that have been made. You know, you have the Trailmaster, the Natchez buoy, the Laredo buoy, but he really came up with something very super cool, which is very reminiscent of a famous design called the Southwestern buoy. And if I'm not mistaken, it might, this might even be similar to the Musso buoy, but this is a very good definition of what may be called a utilitarian buoy. So it's kind of trying to do double duty because it's both, it has some combat aspects to it, but some utilitarian purposes to it. Clearly the combat aspects to it, number one, take a look at that guard. This is called an S guard. So it covers not just half of the front knuckles, but also has this part as well. So it, ha it works as a kind of guard and cover. You have this very nice pommel on this, this side, which is really super cool. Super sharp edge. I'm not even gonna mess with that one. The only thing, in my opinion, that makes it very tough to really call a combat buoy is that lack of a false edge. It's very, there's no false edge on it uh, at all. The reason why it doesn't have a false edge, especially since, since it's a production buoy, the reason for it is because since it is production, you need a differentially hardened buoy. The blade itself has to be differentially hardened to make sure that this part is stiff enough so it can hold an edge. But this part, the spine, has to be flexible enough and soft enough so that it can absorb any sort of shocks. So you want a little bit of um, hardness over here so you can sharpen it, but enough softness over here so it can absorb any sort of shocks. So this is what's called a through hardened. This is a through hardened blade, meaning it's the same Rockwell hardness all the way across. 
so it doesn't have that differential hardness, which is one part's a little bit of softness for shock absorption, and one part of it is a little bit of uh, hardness so that it can hold an edge and it can be sharpened. Still very good, but a little bit also on the heavy side. But note also, if I'm gonna go ahead and do that back cut and I drop it here, it just drops. It's just so heavy. <laughs> you know, if I do a back cut, there's no, there's no bounce. It just, it just drops straight down. And that's, to me, a, it's still a very good buoy. I'll tell you right now, somebody breaks into my house, all of a sudden I bust this out, they're gonna go, okay, I'm in the wrong apartment, okay? So clearly, as just as a visual intimidation tool, this one, right? So what makes a combat buoy, again, with a true combat buoy, especially when it's customized by a true master, by Bill Bagwell, I'm gonna make note of this again. You have a sharpened false edge, very sharp. You saw the demo last time, the way it cut, it was so fine through that paper. I've done it on softer targets, you know, a little bit of cardboard, stuff like that, and it was so razor precise. So you have a false edge, true edge, you have the fighting guard here as well, but the other part is the fact that it's balanced so well that if I do a back cut, there's a natural, you see how it just naturally, it wants to naturally flow into that next movement, which is a reverso, and we're gonna be covering that today. Before we proceed, I wanna read a portion of the James Bowie book that Raymond Thorpe wrote, and it was about a duel that occurred in the House of Representatives in Arkansas in 1837. Apparently, a fight broke out between two House of Representatives, and when they got into it, both of them had Bowie knives. So when the fight broke out, it turned out one guy had a nine inch long Bowie knife, but the other guy had a 12 inch long Bowie knife. And then the way it was reported, the first fight, there was a first, it was a clean miss, but the second caught Wilson's left and guarding arm just below the elbow. The keen edge slashed through the cloth and flesh to the bone in a stream of blood spurted into the air. But despite this, the guy came forward with his almost severed arm hanging limply. Despite the pain and much loss of blood, he seemed cool. He the other guy lost his nerve and threw his knife. The other guy ran after him and pretty much just cornered him and did this upswept, upward, mighty stroke with the buoy and the blade sank in its full nine inches into the other guy's chest. After this, the speaker fell on the floor, weak from the loss of blood, both on hands and knees, he crawled to his dead opponent, withdrew his buoy, wiped it clean on Anthony's coat, replaced it in its sheath, and fainted. A blade so deadly as in one short year to displace the pistol and relegate the sword cane to oblivion. A weapon so fearful as to be singled out for drastic state bans, steel so universally used that even the most respectable must tote a buoy or shun all society. We are, of course, talking about the extraordinarily powerful Bowie knife for a different kind of era, different kind of men who subscribe to a way of fighting and a way of living that is very foreign to us now. There was a hardness to it and a directness to it. So gentlemen like the late Mr. Bill Bagwell and Master at Arms James Keating helped put together the current curriculum of American Bowie combatives. We also can't forget the late and great Colonel Dwight McLemore, whose books and whose workshops actually help provide a lot of the curriculum for what is now known as the American Bowie Combative System. And I'm going to be showing you a lot of what that work looks like, especially in this video in terms of the back cut flow, including the reverso. But keep in mind when I'm showing this to you, remember that chapter I read from the James Bowie book and those two Arkansas House of Representatives and what they were doing because that's how deadly those techniques were, which were absolutely supported by one of the most powerful powerful tools ever made and probably the most powerful knife that ever existed. So let's do a bit of a review. Remember the back cut. You see how the back cut, the blade doesn't even register on the camera. It all but disappears. That's how powerful the technique was. But we're going to review today a back cut flow into a reverso. So this is what a back cut, then a reverso. A reverso is on the inside line and catches the wrist. So right about there, there's a bit of an invite, but then I cut right through. So we're inspiring. We didn't call this defanging the snake. This was disemboweling the snake, or as Neo would say, there is no snake. So back in the day when I would spar with buoy trainers, this is how it would look like, but we'd also remember what the chapter was with those Arkansas representatives, because every time we got hit, something was gonna get disemboweled. So that 
that's how we would think of it, then it would be finished by a snap cut, we would just split our skulls open. But out of all the techniques that terrified us in sparring, it would be this position which would set up the midline back cut, which is right to that bottom elbow, and it would just come right in so fast it won't even register in the eye, and it would just hit that bottom elbow and it would hurt so bad. But the worst part was that you won't even see it when it happens. You just get hit so hard, but you also think you might have an opportunity for defanging the snake. But just when you think you have that opportunity, you get hit, and then you get this look in your face, and the sparring partner's just looking at you. In the meantime, you got these other people looking at you, and they're thinking, yeah, you ate that. But this one is worse because now you think you have an opening with this reverso, and now you're just gonna come right back in. But this is sparring. In real life, that arm would have fallen off. But as you come in, you get cut on the inside line so now your arm just got cut as a, also with your left elbow so you just eat it and so that's what that flow looks like so it's a midline back cut to a reverso I'm gonna show you this other angle over here so just be mindful that when you're doing this back cut to reverso there's another dynamic here because this is an arm centric movement as the elbow turns down but note how the hip now turns out when you do this so the back cut reverso is not just arm centric it is the perfect combination of arm centric movement and hip movement remember in the other video when i said that bill bago would take a measure of my hand he was doing that to figure out how much torque my hip could produce so with the buoy back cut flow it is really this great seamless combination of arm centric and core centric movement it's an invaluable exercise that allows us to recapture how the warriors of a long time ago were able to move and fight in those really hardened battles, not just in terms of their physicality, but also in their spirits. Thank you very much. I really hope you enjoyed this video.